that will call me flowing the head. Um, we are we were recording on this one. Now we're recording on both of them. Makes sense. You don't really watch YouTube. You're like a pristine kid. Other than whatever's going on now. Maybe this is why we got our teeth cleaned the other day. Because we're going live on the internet. <laughs> All right. People can watch us now, just so you know. All right. You ready? All right. Welcome to uh, Sunset Spark uh, on CS for All's Surf's Up Waves All Day. We're doing lesson four today. Um, light waves. And I have my special guest, Elo. Hi. He's my son. He's in third grade. He's eight years old. He likes animals, Pokemon. Um, Legos. You like Legos, yeah. All right. So, light waves. Um, we're getting to near the end of this. There's a lot of noise out there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so today we're going to be starting by looking at animals. Elo, do you know any animal super senses? Um, super senses. Uh, do you know what a sense is? Yeah. That's like something an animal mm. can feel or detect. Do you know any animals? I know you do because we watch Wildcraft all the time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some of these will give you some hints. Um, it's hard when you're on camera, isn't it? Yeah. You start, you get stage fright. Well, what are dogs good at? Sniffing. Sniffing. Dogs can smell things really good, so they're trackers. Um, what about chameleons? Do chameleons have any super senses? Mm, no. That's not true. Their skin can detect the light around them, so their skin can react oh, yeah. to change to camouflage. It's actually their skin that does it, which is pretty cool. What about snakes? Do snakes have any super senses? Mostly just the snake. They can, they can, they say they taste with their, they they smell with their tongue, but they're really, um, they're, it's it's a mix of tasting and smelling with their tongue. They're picking up chemicals with it. What about ants? Oh, that's yes. But there was also one. There was one little can't smell. A dead animal, um, one mile away. Really? And that does it eat those animals? Yeah. What, what lizard is it? Komodo dragon. Oh, I thought they, I thought they bit the animals and followed them, but I guess that makes sense. They bite them and let them walk away. Yeah. All right. We didn't really talk about butterflies here. What kind of senses would be good for a butterfly? Um, flowers. Well, they like flowers. So what, yeah. would, what would be a good sense if they were looking for a flower? What would you want to do? Um, like look for the colors. So they want to use their eyes for that. Would, could yeah. they hear flowers? No. No. Um, what about touching flowers? You think they could like touch the flower? Mm, probably no. They probably wouldn't touch to find a flower. They'd be flying around like ah. until they touch one. Um, what about tasting a flower? You think they taste the flower? Mm, no, I would think they taste. What about smelling the flower? Smelling? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, let's learn more. So did you know that the things we use to sense are actually called receptors? Receptors are special kinds of cells that power our senses. So receptors, like up here I have a picture of a tongue and our tongue has receptors in it for picking up chemicals in food and that's how we figure out taste it's by the chemicals in the food oh. and so same thing with our nose our nose has receptors in it that pick up chemicals in the air so when we smell things we're actually using um we're actually smelling and tasting the chemicals oh. so we smell chemicals in the air we can smell chemicals in the food we can taste chemicals in the food um, there's a cool experiment I did with my students last week where they pinched their nose and we gave them a candy and when they uh, they couldn't really taste the candy when they had their nose pinched but when they let go of their nose it was like a flavor burst 
Oh, um, I want to do that. I want to eat a treat. You've been having treats all all afternoon, so I don't think mm, that's gonna. I hadn't. Um. Anyway, so chemo chemo receptors are the specialized receptors for sensing chemicals. Now I'm talking to the teachers, not to you, uh, but I'll talk to you in just a moment. Ah. Uh. Uh, and so when we're smelling herbs or spices, we're really smelling the chemicals that those those plants are releasing into the air. When we taste food, we're tasting the chemicals that are in the food. Um, so cooking is like chemistry. But that doesn't really help us with butterflies. So what would be some good senses for butterflies? Now we know a little bit more about receptors. If you were a butterfly, you might want to look for the flower. You might want to smell the flower. Oh, yeah. Um, but the butter butterflies have noses. No, I don't, I don't think. I don't think they really have traditional noses. And you can taste the flower. Yeah. The butterflies have tongues. Yeah. It, yeah, it's like a tongue. It's called a proboscis. I once seen a butterfly actually use it once. We, we've seen that quite a bit. We, you, <laughs> you love catching your butterflies. I once caught one with my own hands. Once, you do that. People love watching you chase butterflies in the park. And then eventually you catch them. And once people clap when you caught it. Uh, so uh, butterflies, a lot of kids say, b some kids know that butterflies taste with their feet. Um, and why might they want to why might a butterfly taste with its feet? We have more guests. Oh no. Why might butterflies taste with their feet, Elo? Um, to like figure out what um, it's a flower. A flower, yeah. yeah. A plant, a good plant for what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how we go around and taste. Well, you ask me a lot of times, you go, is this spicy? Uh, or you ask me, is this healthy food? Because that's a good way of knowing if something is going to be tasty or not. Um, so plant, so butterflies, again, when they taste, they're really just picking up the chemicals in the plants. But they do have, res they do have chemo receptors in their feet. So they do kind of taste with their feet. Um, and they do that uh, because their legs help them identify a good place, places to eat and where to lay their eggs. Like monarch butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed oh, yeah. because the caterpillars that grow from their eggs only eat milkweed and that's what makes them grow strong and big. We went to that place, remember we went, we went to that beach in New Jersey and we went to the butterfly sanctuary there. Do you remember doing that? It was like mm. two summers ago. No. Um, Mom remembers it. Mom wants to go back there. Uh, but here is a little butterfly. They're very tiny. So if you ever see, this is for bug hunters and teachers at home. If you ever see holes in the leaf, what should you do? Um, like leave it. Um, it usually means there's a caterpillar nearby. Yes, yeah, so you could flip the leaf over and you can see if you can find anything. And sometimes you'll find little little egg sacs there. And a caterpillar pops out of that. Uh, and there's a sanctuary on the Jersey Shore. It's a great place. You can pretty much go there all summer and find, even even in uh, September, and still find monarchs and little baby caterpillars and, and eggs there um, as they're getting ready to uh, migrate. Um, so butterflies, are good at tasting, but it's not really their super sense, their true super sense. Their true super sense has to do with, what do we see in this picture? It's very colorful. Um, bright colors? You see lots of bright colors, and that is because butterflies are masters of color. Butterflies aren't just colorful, their food sources are colorful too, so they're always looking for flowers, or they're looking for other butterflies to mate with. And so they are, they, they, they need to identify color really well. And down here, we'll talk about this later, but these are different butterflies you can find in New York. Um, New York State, not just New York City. I think I might have found, I think I might found, I found three of these, I think. We've seen the monarch. I think that's a white cabbage. Um, this one right here. Yeah. That's an orange sulfur. 
Oh, then no. But you've found, you've found sulfur before. Yeah. And we've definitely found white, white cabbages in the list, too. Um, but butterflies are even more colorful in the eyes of other butterflies. Butterflies have really good receptors in their eyes for detecting color. So butterflies look even more colorful to other butterflies. Um, here are some butterflies. We've never seen these. This one is in Madagascar. I wow. want to go to Madagascar. I don't know if I'm ever going to go to Madagascar, but I want to <laughs> go to Madagascar so bad. And this one is found on the west coast of Africa. It's called a Western Blue Beauty. I'm not even going to try to say the na name on this one. It's Chrysoridia rifius. Maybe <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Um, but these, they look colorful to us, but in the eyes of a butterfly, it's like they're glow in the dark practically. Like they're, they're, they're iridescent. Um, and back to receptors. So receptors are for, receptors are for sensing. And so we taste is sensed by chemoreceptors. Um, smell is sensed by chemoreceptors too. But color is sensed by something called photoreceptors, which are a different type of cell, still a receptor, but different specialization. And so photoreceptors are for picking up the visual light spectrum. Um, so here is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And humans can only see this little part of it right here. Um, we've shown the, the spectrum in other parts of this presentation because we've been talking about waves. This is for teachers at home. We've been talking about waves. Uh, and we've talked about, we're going to be talking about radio waves next week. Um, we've talked about gamma rays in another class, another lesson as part of an extension. Um, and so today we're talking about light waves, which is just this little section right here of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And we can only see a little sliver of it. We can only see red to purple, basically. Um, beyond this, beyond the red on this side is infrared. Beyond the purple on this side is ultraviolet. Um, and butterflies are super perceptive to light. So humans only have two photoreceptors, cones and rods. What do you know about my eyes, Zelo? Do you remember any, mm. any secrets about me? I am not, my eyes are not great. Oh, yeah. I'm colorblind, yeah. so I don't, I, I can't always see reds and greens. I know that's a red shirt, but sometimes reds look green to me, and sometimes greens look red, because I don't have as many photoreceptors. I still have cones and rods, but I don't have as many of the reds and greens as I need to. Um, butterflies have at least six photoreceptors, and there's some that even have 15 or more. So they have, at a minimum, they have three times as many photoreceptors as us. Uh, that's a lot. Um, but some have like eight times as many as us. So butterflies can really see a lot, a lot Aww. of light. They're very sensitive to ultraviolet light, um, which we can't see. Uh, there are some women, some girls, who are, I think, one out of every like eight one out of every eight girls has a special photoreceptor for seeing purple, and so they can see a little bit more purple than other people. So they have like super senses too. Um, some, some humans have a little bit more superpower in col seeing color than humans, than regular humans. But, uh, but everyone sees a little bit differently. Um, like I don't always see all the colors. You might see colors a little differently than mom. That's just how it is. Uh, the back to the visible light spectrum. So butterflies here are they can see the regular spectrum, the regular visible light spectrum, but they can also go well into the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, where do I have more here? So uh, along with being able to see the ultraviolet spectrum, um, it's not just to detect flowers, but their, their wings also have ultraviolet colors in them. And so they communicate with that. And there's a link in the resources here for teachers uh, that was, um, it's kind of written for high school students, but, but it can be broken down for fourth and fifth grade students. 
um, where they talk about how butterflies can communicate with ultraviolet light. Uh, actually, sorry, that's not that article. This one is a Wikipedia page that talks about it. Uh, it's a short Wikipedia page, though. It's really, it's really interesting how butterflies use ultraviolet um, that we don't even think about because we can't see it. So butterflies have a high range of color depth. Color depth is the amount of, amount of colors that can be seen. Um, all humans have a slight variation in color depth. As I mentioned, I'm colorblind. Some women can see more purple. Um, and, uh, and everyone sees a little bit differently. Um, you, know, you can go in the back with mom for a little bit. Just okay. Stay. All right. I'll call you back over when I need you for the next part. Oh, Edir, can you turn off his mic? All right. Great. All right. Um, so color depth is the amount of color that can be seen. All humans have slight variations in color depth. Um, and I said that already. Oh, so let's look at color depth in, um, in computers. So uh, here's some examples of, we talked about bits uh, two weeks ago. Um, so here's an example of two bits, two bit color or one bit color depth, which just means two colors. Um, so if we look in here, this is uh, basically two different versions of gray, a really dark gray and a slightly lighter gray. They don't have to be gray, but typically that's how it's represented when you have one bit color because you're dealing with basically black and white, but it doesn't have to be black and white as we've seen here. It's just whatever two colors you're going to be working with. And so this is, uh, this is one bit color, which is two colors. Here we have... Uh, We've just doubled our colors. Now we have two-bit colors, and we can see four colors now. Um, and so we can see this like brownish-green color here, this here, and one, two, three. What's the fourth color? One, two, three, four. Oh, there's two. There's a light gray and a dark gray. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now. We're gonna get, we're gonna double it again. Now we have four bits, and now we have 16 colors, two to the fourth powers, so that's 16 colors. And now we've got a smattering of white in here, really opening up. Um, this is how computers worked 30, 40 years ago as we slowly increased the amount of colors that we could handle with our video cards. And so we went from four bit color to eight bit color. Computers were using eight bit color for a very long time. Oh, this image. I should have scaled it properly. Uh, it's a little bit blurry here. But this is 256 colors, which is basically like the early 90s, early mid 90s. A lot of computers were doing 256 colors, 8-bit. Um, and, uh, and so 2 to the 8th powers is 256. That's where the, that comes from. And at this time, they used some optimization called, they, had, they could define their palettes. It could be whatever 256 colors you wanted. but uh, a lot of times, like the operating system, like Windows, wouldn't handle the color palettes properly. So the 256 colors between two images or two applications might have been different, and so it may have messed up the way the colors looked because it was using a wrong, the wrong color palette. Uh, the so the color palette, basically, think about like a, bo a box of crayons. They used a different 256 box of crayons, but still colored them like they were the same ones. And so things would look messed up sometimes. Now we're getting into like modern, like late 90s uh, tech, where we have 24-bit color, uh, which is 16 million. So we went from 256 to 16 million. Um, and this comes because each color now has 24-bit is really three channels, 8-bit uh, for red, 8-bit for green, 8-bit for blue. And so now they, you have 16 million colors, um, which is plenty to work with. Uh, and most displays couldn't display more than that anyway at the time. Um, and most computers are still using 24-bit color now, uh, unless you are like a gamer and care about like um, high dynamic range and stuff like that, which we're going to talk about in just a slide or two. Um, so we have 1-bit, 2-bit, 4-bit, 8-bit, 24-bit. 
there's other bits too. Other op these are just com these are common ones, but there's other common ones too. There's five bit color, and uh, and three bit color too that was used by some operating systems. Um, we can see another version of it here where we see the color depth where it's, a, it's one bit. You basically get a black and a white. It doesn't have to be black and white though. Um, here's three bit, which I think was used by SGI maybe. No, SGI would have been much later. I'm not sure who used 3-bit. Uh, I think SGI used 5-bit, maybe. Uh, but 3-bit, or maybe it was Amiga that used 5-bit. 3-bit, um, 2 to the third power, which is 8 colors. Um, and you can see as it increases, 2 to the eighth, 256, which looks pretty good there. It looks like a pretty good gradient, but that's just because it's in black and white. Um, Grayscale, uh, as they say sometimes. and now we have much finer color. So we have, in the last 10 years, there's been HDR, high dynamic range colors. So we've been using 24-bit um, since the mid-90s, which is also called true color. I don't know if that's like a trademark thing or if it, I don't think it means anything. I think that's just what Windows called it. Uh, and that's the last like 20, 25 years. And again, that was eight bits for red, green, and blue channels for 24-bit total. But with HDR, uh, they don't call it 30-bit. Uh, it's really called, te it's 10-bit, but it's 10 bits per channel. There's some that it's more for like medical imagery that's 12 bits per channel because it, it gets more detail there. Um, and the 10 bits uh, it drastically increases the amount of coloring. So here's some examples. It's really hard to show on a monitor because YouTube or whatever I'm recording this will mm -hmm. compress it a little bit. So it might not show the, the smooth gradient here. Um, and, uh, but on the 8-bit side, you can see when we're looking just the red channel, you can see the gradient of reds changing. Uh, like you can see that, that line, that uh, sort of like a dithering. They would call it like an artifact or, or dithering. Um, and you don't see that on 10-bit. Uh, and again, this is just looking at one channel. But, uh, but high dynamic range does make a difference, but a lot of times uh, a TV will support it, but the pixels, the output of the, the monitor doesn't really show it, like it's too dark, not bright enough, so it doesn't really show, show it when it does support HDR. Um, but HDR is, again, has to do with color depth. Um, let's go down. So butterflies have better color depth than humans. They get a little award there. Uh, butterflies see more colors, specifically in the ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. When we talk about high dynamic range and color depth in computers, we're not talking about the ultraviolet. We're just talking about a, m a larger variety of colors um, in a color palette that, uh, that a computer can show um, with, the, with the pixels uh, that power a, a screen, the, like the LED pixels that power the screen. Um, so. We're not looking at ultraviolet colors when we see high dynamic range image, high dynamic range HDR images on a on a screen. We're not looking at ultraviolet. We're just looking at more color depth in what the humans can see, whereas butterflies have a better color depth and they're seeing more ultraviolet colors than humans. Um, but butterflies see more color, but not more detail. Um, they have a poor resolution. So now we've moved on past color depth. Now we're looking at resolution. And so butterflies see things pixelated. Uh, when we talk about pixelation and resolution, we're talking about the area of a screen or area of an image. Um, so here we have uh, uh, HD, or sometimes we call it 2K, which isn't traditional. You would normally call it HD, but I do see um, some people call it 2K because it's about 2,000 pixels. Uh, horizontally, but it's really 1920. Uh, 1,920 by 1,080. Normally someone would say 1920 by 1080, or it's commonly referred to as 1080p in like, when you're talking about like videos and screens. Elo. 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 Shh. You're not going to get your Pokemon cards. Keep acting up. <laughs> I'm bribing him with Pokemon cards. Uh, okay, so back to this. 
Um, so 1920 by 1080, which is about 2 million pixels. Um, and that's considered HD resolution, which we've had since the early 2000s. Um, and that's a significant increase from older displays. So SD, so now we have 4K, and 4K is 8 million pixels, which is 3840 by 2160. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as 2160p um, because of the, the vertical pixel range. Um, and it's twice as big in terms of vertical and horizontal width and height as HD. Um, so there's 8 million pixels in the area. And HD was already more than double the size of SD from like the 80s and 90s. So we've had a big increase in resolution in our, in our displays in the last uh, in the last 15 years. Um, and, uh, and that's true for gaming devices too. Um, if you use like a Nintendo Switch, that has a nice display on it. Or phones have gotten significantly better. Like when, they, when Apple talks about like a retina display, they're talking about like basically like a 4K type display um, or ultra high definition UHD resolution. So phones have uh, different terminology to say the same thing, which is um, a lot more pixels on the screen. Sometimes they call it, sometimes it's measured in DPI, dots per inch, and dots is just another way to say pixels. DPI does come from the printing world where you might print, a printer would have a DPI because it's actually making dots when it prints, but they use that for, for screens now too to say uh, the pixel depth for a screen. Um, it's important to talk about because cameras have uh, a resolution too. Uh, we can have like a 8 megapixel or a 14 megapixel camera or, or a, there's gigapixel cameras now too. Um, I think there's some camera phones that have like 40 megapixel cameras. Uh, and you're talking about resolution too and they're talking about it the same way but a screen is an output and a camera is an input. Um, and they're both doing resolution the camera is sensing it with the, with the sensor inside, and the screen is outputting it with the, the LED pixels behind the screen. Uh, they're both using resolution in similar ways, but one is outputting it and one is inputting it. Um, so you might wanna, when you bring this up with kids or with yourself, you just wanna might make sure you're being clear on which one's the input and which one's the output. Um, so back to butterflies. Butterflies see in a low resolution. Um, their eyes are acting as the input, and they see in a low resolution. Um, this is why I brought up the input-output thing, because we're talking about butterflies' eyes, which are an input, but then I'm talking about screens, which is an output, and I don't want to confuse anyone. Um, it's not exactly like what I've shown here in my picture. This is just a visual representation. Uh, it's probably blurrier and not quite as pixely, um, but I couldn't find a good example or I don't think anyone really knows what they actually s look like, see like, see like, but uh, it's definitely described as pixelated. Um, so let's look at some inspirations for. So now that sort of wraps up our talk on butterflies, and we're going to move on to another type of butterfly. Elo, you're summoned. This is your part. I'll turn it back on. You better believe it returns. Okay. Welcome. All right. So I've been talking about butterflies and now I'm talking about game designers who get inspiration from nature and I need you to help me out. So I'm talking about a game designer named Satoishi Tajiri. He grew up in rural Japan. We know a little bit about Japan. Yeah. Um, in the 1970s, not the 80s, we talk about the 80s sometimes, but no, he was in the 70s. He loved exploring and bug collecting. What do you know about that? Mm. You like collecting bugs and watching Definitely. bugs? Definitely, yeah. Um, and so this is where he grew up, in a mountainous area. There's a little bridge there. And Satoishi loved gaming too. He shared his love of gaming by creating a zine as a kid, I think he was more of a teenager. So here's a zine that he made. He made magazines called Game Freak. Mm. Satoishi was a game designer. Can you imagine what he created? Mm. 
Video game. What video game do you think you may have created? Mm. Satoichi Tajiri oh. created Pokemon with Ken Sugimori. So that's Satoshi. Sorry, I was saying Satoichi. Satoshi. That's Satoshi. And that's uh, Ken. So Ken was the artist. And Satoshi was the designer. He's the one who came up with the idea about a bug collecting video game. And in our resources here, we have a good video. We have two videos. One is more meant for kids. that talks about uh, Satoshi um, and how he developed it. It's animated. The video is animated. And it's kind of short. I think it's like six minutes. Uh, it also talks about how he, he may have had some learning differences. I'll talk about that when I get there, though. Um, and... So he created the idea for the game, but he wasn't a good artist. If we look at some of these magazines, um, actually, I have some of the magazines in the drive here. Let's bring some up. So here was his early magazines. Oh, we'll get to that picture later. Um, and so he wasn't really a great artist compared to the, the later ones, like this one when he meets Ken, who can draw a little bit. That's not a good scan. Let's find this one. So here's one. I think that's when he started getting his inspiration for Pokemon. Uh, so his friend Ken, who is in this picture here too, is the one who drew that. Um, and so he did the artwork for it, and Satoshi came up with the game design, and they brought it to Nintendo. Uh, they were journalists, so they were writing about video games, and they went from writing about video games to making video games. And here's where we talk about some sprites. Uh, so when we're talking about light, we might want to talk about pixels and sprites and depth, and so in the first Pokemon video game. So these two on the, on the left here are from the first Pokemon video game. It's this Caterpie, the Caterpillar. Um, and this is from 1998. That was 15 years before you were born, Elo. And this is, the first one's in grayscale because the Game Boy did not have color. And they had a colorized version of it too for the Game Boy Color. And the file size for this was only 354 bytes. Uh, I'll call you back when I need you, buddy. All right. Um, so the file size for this was only 354 bytes, which if we remember from our data talks, that is not a lot of bytes. That's so tiny. Um, we burn through kilobytes of data all the time just, just by you know, the equivalent of digitally blinking. Um, and the resolution was only 34 by 29 pixels. And it was one frame, not animated. So this is 1998, 354 bytes and a resolution of 34 by 29. Uh, and this is the colorized version that was used in the Game Boy Color. Well, it was the same image, but they had color data in it. And so it was 10 extra bytes for the color data, which was to describe the palette. Um, so they needed 10 bytes to des describe the palette, which is what colors they were going to use, because each Pokemon uh, had a had a different palette to it, different colors going on. So you could describe the palette as part of the, the file and still use the grayscale data. And then a short 14 years later, they finally had animated ones in Pokemon with Pokemon Black and White 2. Uh, and so this is the animated sprite for Caterpie, which was 18 kilobytes, um, still roughly the same size, 36 by 37 pixels, but it was 81 frames animated. And it was full color-ish. But you can still see the pixels, and it's not a very high resolution. But it does use significantly more data. It uses 60 times more data, uh, I think. Uh, let's see. I think that's important. 18,000 divided by 364. 50 times. Huh, not a bad guess. Uh, 50 times more data to make this animated one, which was 81 frames. Um, and uh, in modern ones, here is a 3D model of Caterpie. 
And so we have the 3D model on the left here, and we have the, the texture on the right. Last week I was talking about textures a little bit. So 3D models and textures are separated. So you have the 3D model and then the texture that goes with it. So this texture gets painted on top, basically, of this model. It gets stretched out and pulled on top. So I don't talk about the, the 3D model size because I don't have an accurate number for that. But the texture resolution, or the texture size, was about 61 kilobytes, uh, 61,000 bytes. And the resolution was 512 by 256. As we're going through the, uh, these next few ones, you'll notice that all the texture resolutions are powers of 2, which is mean it's 2 to the power of some number. Uh, so this is, I think, 2 to the 8 and 2 to the 4th. Is that right? 2 to the, I used to know all this by heart. Now 2 to the 8th and 2 to the 9th. So 2 to the 8th and 2 to the 9th. They do that because it helps with um, the way that the, pic the textures are loaded into the visual, me the GPU, the graphics memory. And so it helps having powers of 2 the way everything is packed in there and the way the math works out when it's like stretching it out and computing it. So generally textures have to be, I don't know if this is still true, but back when I used to do game development, everything had to be a power of two. Um, and let's look at another one. Since we're looking at butterflies, let's look at Butterfree. So again, we have the Butterfree one, which is a bit bigger, it's 587 bytes, and it was 54 by 49 pixels. Um, no difference for this one for the color palette. I couldn't figure out why the, the byte, the file size was the same. But uh, here's the colorized version. And then in black and white 2 from 2012, we've got 32 kilobytes. Uh, and smaller resolution, actually, 36 by 37 pixels. But now it's nice and animated with 81 frames here. Um, and you can see how even with a small resolution, you can still make something look really, really smooth and... and uh, Artist, oh, can't see the numbers there. Uh, 32 kilobytes, 37. And here is the um, here's the 3D model for Butterfree uh, that I took from the Pokemon X and Y game on Nintendo 3DS from 2013, which was just a year later, I think, from Black and White 2. Uh, and this one actually has three textures that went with it: one for the wings, one for the eyes, and one for the body. And again, you'll see that all the textures are powers of 2, 128 by 64, 512 by 256, 256 by 256. And that's generally how all the, the, the textures are going to be. Um, and maybe that's something when we get to the activity you want to enforce on kids to make it like a power of 2, or maybe just say it has to be an even number. Um, that's important when you're making games now. Like retro sort of pixel art is kind of big in games again. And as like an artistic... Uh, way of making the games, um, a retro feel. And so some people don't make games that are what they call pixel perfect, which is to say like um, they, they don't use powers of two. And so like they, when they double things, it's not quite right. Or they have something that doesn't, like, doesn't quite look right. And it's not really pixel perfect or they rotate the pixels. Um, so they're angular. Uh, anyway, so in this case, the textures are spread on different parts of Caterpie or on Butterfree here, so that each one applies in a different way. And so you have both, you have to have, the texture always has to wrap around the whole object or whatever part of the object you're dealing with. And so that's why the wings have both sides, even though they look the same, you still have to have a texture that wraps, wraps the 3D model. Um, these 3D models, uh, you don't really see polygons in these, unfortunately. I can't use this as a good example. But if you remember, if you're a gamer and you played games from like the, from the, like PlayStation, GameCube, PlayStation 2 era, like polygons were very noticeable, uh, especially in arcade games in the 90s, like Virtua Fighter and Virtua Racing uh, or Tekken. Um, but now, so, the, so polygons were important because a graphics card could only handle so much math, and each polygon, each new polygon re requires more math. Uh, but now graphics cards can handle pretty good amount of poly like that's not really a big issue now. Like now their graphics cards are more dealing with like shading and lighting and stuff like that. But some gamers like to make games that have lower polygons uh, as a, again an artistic statement. Think about like Minecraft or um, oh my God, I can't remember the. 
uh, Roblox. Uh, I wish I could wipe Roblox from my memory. Anyway, uh, so like blocky, sort of fewer polygon models are kind of like an artistic statement now, or people like to use them. It's also easier to, they're easier to make, and you can make them look good. These low poly, they call them low poly, because they're low polygons, are, um, are, and polygons are just the faces, not the physical faces, but the, like, the number of like shapes around the, the model. So these low polygon, uh, low poly models are like in vogue now, and uh, and they still have textures that wrap around. I don't have. I was able to combine the textures for these, uh, but they uh, gold systems were limited with their graphics capabilities. But now it's more about you know artistic minimalism and a retro aesthetic. And so these are these are taken from Pokemon Quest on the. It's, an, it's a mobile app, mobile game. So let's get to our lesson. Elo, you're back. So we have a few activities here. Um, let's turn you on. All right, you're back. And uh, so we could, one of our activities for this project could be focusing on a new sprite digitally. Uh, will it be higher resolution or low resolution? Uh, like, will it be pixelated or not? And if you're using a tool outside of Scratch, you can export the image to import it into Scratch and add it to the unit project uh, if you are making, game, making a game. As we described, if you're making a game for this unit, you can use this opportunity to make a new have students make a new sprite. We're going to do a different version of, of bringing it into Scratch, but I just wanted to, like, if you're going to use uh, Make a or another pixel art thing, I think Google has one. I have... I have some in the resources. If not, I'll, I'll add them in there in the next day or two. But uh, there's different pixel art tools online you can use. Um, and then you could students export that, which again, much like the sound ones from last week, it can be a bit difficult to export the, uh, the files for younger kids. So if you're going to do that with younger kids, you might want to prep that yourself um, if you're using, if you're going to do all of this digitally with a tool. Uh, you could also be inspired by uh, the Game Freak zine that we saw, and maybe you want to have students uh, make their own zine or make pages for a class zine where they all write a little bit about the game and ex or video game experience. They can draw some pictures. They can work on it as a group, spend a little bit of time to it, and bind them all together to make a little booklet. Um, this might work well if you're doing like a museum exhibit, uh, as we've talked about. Um, and you could have kids act as game journalists to either write a review or write about what a game means to them or an experience or a story about a game. Uh, in the resources, I'll, uh, I'll show you that um, I have a bit more for the, the game freak to kind of inspire kids here. Um, and then we have the activity ELO did, uh, which was create a new sprite. Uh, will it be high resolution or low resolution pixelated? Um, so we use graph paper that's in the resource folder. Um, I have some examples here of, of we have a higher resolution ones. And like the, basically the size of the blocks dictates how much of the resolution is. I'd recommend using bigger blocks for younger kids, smaller blocks for older kids, uh, so you can get more details in there. And so the kids can color it in with, I think, I think crayon works better, but uh, marker or paint you could use too. Uh, watercolor, I wouldn't use wet paint, I'd use watercolor. Uh, and um, and they can create a sprite. And Elo made one here. And he made, you want to hold him up? So you made a few Pokemon. Uh, you didn't know we were talking about Pokemon today. Uh, so you made, what's that guy's name? Is it Voltorb? Yeah, Voltorb. Voltorb. Um, and you made, this guy's kind of hard to see in the camera. Uh, it's micellary. And then we're going to look at, you made a nice dark one here, uh, Stunfisk. And because not everyone knows the various Pokemon, most people only know the Gen 1 Pokemon. They know Charmander, Squirtle, Pikachu. Yeah. No one knows the deep cuts that you do. Uh, so we, I scanned this in already. Um, and I copied the image. And I made a new image from the clipboard. And I saved it. I already did all that. Let me show you what the Pokemon looks like. So he was creating this Pokemon. 
which is like this flounder like flat fish looking Pokemon. Hey, but you didn't do the Galar one. Oh, I didn't show the Galar one? Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for reminding me. Um, so that's the one he's got here. And we're going to bring it into Scratch so that we can use it. So I already scanned it, as I said. Um, and now let's go to Scratch. MIT, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to do create. And we don't need that. All right, so we're going to go down here. Can't see that. We go down here to choose a sprite, and we're going to do upload a sprite. And here's the one that I saved. I'm going to do upload. And once I have it in here, it's much too big. And it's got the graph paper in the background. So we're going to go to costumes. We're going to go to costumes. And now we're going to use the selection tool to delete some of our blocks. So we're just going to highlight our blocks here and kind of get the outline of it. Because someone couldn't stay in the lines. Just kidding. Uh, we're just going to clean it up. All, all artwork needs to be cleaned up when you make it digital. This isn't anything to feel bad about. It's just the way the world is. Clean that up a little bit. Done. Clean you up. All right, we've cleaned it up. Now we're going to scale it down. So we're going to highlight the whole thing, just to make it smaller. There we go. Uh, maybe we should make the bottom right there. Make it in the middle. All right. So now we've got our our stun fisk that we can use in the game. Um, if we wanted to program it and make a game with this one, we could do it again if we wanted to. Let's just. Show another example. If we wanted to get Voltorb. Voltorb looks like a Pokeball. And if you're doing this on a different system, uh, hopefully Windows makes it easy to do stuff like this. Um, but my experience is that it does not. Um, but if anyone needs help with this, I'll figure it out for you. Uh, all right, we're going to go to costumes again. We're going to clean this Pokemon up. Also, shrink it and turn it into a Pokeball. Oh, yeah, I want to do the first This one could Pokeball. be used twice. You could also edit these and make them animated if you wanted to. Ah. Uh, like as an example, I'll, I'll use this one as an example. Like we want to make them spin or something. All right, we're almost done cleaning it up. Should we make it spin around a little? What should we do? Uh, what would be a good thing? I know Vault oh like explodes. Yeah, I'd like make it blow up. You want me to make it blow up? <laughs> yeah. Okay. See if we can figure that out. Okay. Um, so we can. Oops, we don't want to add that. We gotta shrink it. Make the center the center. Okay, so now we've got two Pokemon running around here. And that, that dang cat. All right, Voltorb. We're going to paint a new con. I don't know if that's the right way we want to do it. Do copy. All right, so if we want to make it blow up, we could like, we'll have to draw on top of it, but we can separate it a little bit. We can do something like this. 
We could take it and like move it in half. And then we'd have to add like an explosion. There's probably a better way to do this. But as we've talked about. I like that sound effects when I do things. What do you think? Is that a good explosion? <laughs> you like that? <laughs> All right. Um. Bisons have a bulb to explode. It's a Pokemon bond, right? So it explodes from the, from the middle. Oh, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I cut it in half the wrong way. Oh, my God. You're right. Okay, well, you're right, we should have done it. We should have done it like... Like that. Yeah. <laughs> we could make it look like it's talking. Anyway, so we could have it move back and forth like this, talking. <laughs> Here, let's set that up really quick. Um, looks. This is like the lazy way to do it. Uh, vault Orb, Vault Orb 2. And... weights in here. There we go. <laughs> Is that what you wanted? Yeah. It's like Pac-Man, but with a Voltorb. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, that's funny. Oh, should we like make a Pokemon game by Bob Tohu eats the Pokemons? That is a good idea. <laughs> and who would be the Pokemon that eats the ball, though? Um, like the Charmander. We'd have to have Charmander, Charizard in there, because that's like number one name of Pokemon. Charizard. We have to have Pikachu. Yeah. And then we should have a really weird one. Yeah, but the one place to stay safe is at at Blastoise, Venusaur, Raichu, and Charizard. Those will be in the corners. Okay. Anyway, so that is our activity. Thank you, Elo. I owe you a pack of Pokemon cards now. Okay. So. We've got that activity. Hopefully you can see how that could be integrated in. And you've got graph sheets that I made of just different sizes that can be printed out. Um, you could also buy what I find helpful, but I, don't, I can't always find them in the store, are um, their index graph cards. So they're index cards that have graph paper on them. And those work really well because you can just give kids, you say, fill in this graph, this index card. And it's, it's much more streamlined than giving a kid a whole sheet of graph paper. So now we've got some extensions. Uh, I'll go through this quick. We've got a butterfly themed discussion and activities. So we could talk about the monarch journey. Um, we've got a few presentations. This, this is linked to in the lesson plan, but we've, we've done this a few times for CS for All about uh, the monarch migration and how that can integrate in. So we've got a few lessons on that uh, and material on that. You could also do the butterfly stamp etching. Uh, which uses a technique, or well, um, Yudir is not here to correct me on this, but it's either, I think it's Mayans who etched butterflies onto clay pots and stuff like that. And so that's how we know how they studied the butterflies. Uh, and don't quote me on it, it might not have been Mayans or Aztecs, but I'm pretty sure it was. Um, oh. 
Who's the Who's the group? Radio, please, caller, please turn down your radio. Oh, I turned it off. Okay. <laughs> so what? Who's the? Who Who are the group that that do the butterfly? I yeah. believe the Olmecs, but as well as the Aztecs used a um, the te <laughs> use the technique to document like the um, different stages, the life cycles of things like butterflies. So they think of a, a scientific journal, but etched into clay. Great. Take the beast out. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the Olmecs. Um, Anyway, it's a really simple act, uh, or Aztecs. So it's a really simple activity uh, that can basically be used with Play-Doh or like modeling clay and stuff you find in the cafeteria for school uh, or toothpick. Um, and it's pretty cool and it works out really well. Oh, you can't see the bottom there. It works out really well. Um, extra resources. Uh, I've got a video game hour. I got another video game hour podcast. This one's about Pokemon translations by Nob Agasawara. Uh, so this is not a podcast for kids to listen to. There's cursing and stuff like that and uh, some colorful stories. But he basically talks about how you translate a game, what they call localizing it, which means taking it from one language into another language and how not everything translates. So I know some of you are working with L students, so there might be some good stories in here to talk about how translation problems can happen even in the real pro professional adult world um, that might be you know, helpful for your classes and might help connect kids, connect with kids. There's also the story of Satoshi Tajiri, um, which is the animated video I mentioned. It mentions in here that he was, uh, later in life he was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is interesting, but I don't know if it's entirely true. Um, as myself and Lionel, who I've been working with on this, uh, that there's not a lot of evidence of this, that it's more of a story that he was, like he's never come out and said this. Um, so it's not entirely true, but it, uh, so I don't know how much you would wanna focus on that, that, that aspect of it, but it is a, a great story of perseverance and of you know how kids can be interested in things and that can carry on later in life. Uh, there's another video that, this video is great for class. Uh, it's short. Um, this video is, about 25 minutes and it's not good for class, but it gives you a better sense of Pokemon if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and the beginning of this video is nice, so like the first like three minutes of it where it talks, it's got a bit of a climate angle um, about how development sort of took away a lot of the land that he was into and the, the, the bridges and the, the rivers and the creeks that he played at. And he wanted to create a video game to sort of like bring back that experience. Um, so it's got a bit of a, like a development real estate, real estate development climate angle to it, um, which is, which is interesting. Um, and, uh, but it's not really meant for class, but you could take, you could take clips of this for class for sure. Um, I mentioned the Wikipedia page. It's really short, ultra violet communication and butterflies. It talks about how, when you look at butterflies under a, ultralight sensor, you can see different things with them and they communicate through like through ultraviolet light. It's it's really cool. Um, and so it's a way of communicating. Uh, we also have Monarch Watch, which has articles and it's a database for tracking monarchs. So they talk about this gets more into the data of it, but it's got a big database of all the data and the latitudes and longitudes of where the butterflies were found. Um, you can also do it yourself, but it's uh, it's not easy to get a hold of the kits, um, and uh, usually the butterflies aren't around when kids are in school, when, when school's in session. Uh, but it's still a great site to look at and get some ideas from. Frontier, oops, misspelled that. Uh, Frontiers for Young Minds, um, which is a journal sort of meant for high school kids. Um, and they review uh, like graduate student research. Um, and so this one talks about the, the more light, the better, a butterfly with 15 kind of light sensors in its eyes. So this talks about the sensors. And it's meant for high school students, but it's something a teacher could take stuff away from for the classroom, for sure. 
Um, butterfly identification, New York State butterflies. Uh, a lot of these butterflies you can find. The most common ones uh, are white cabbage and sulfurs and swallowtails uh, that I see in New York and my son catches uh, here in the parks. Um, but, but it's a great place to look at local butter to find uh, examples of local butterflies. Um, on the video game side of things, we have Pokemon sprites and 3D models from these two websites. Um, they're easy to just click and save the models. Um, they're easier to view on a Mac than they are a PC. You might need special, special, uh, you might have to download a tool to view the 3D models on a Windows machine. I'm not, I didn't test them out on my, my Windows laptop, but uh, everything was somewhat viewable, uh, well, completely viewable on a Mac. Um, and depend, your mileage may vary on a Windows PC. And that is it for our lesson today uh, on uh, light waves. Uh, if you have any questions, um, just hit me up on email, uh, and um, I'll do my best to, to answer them. Thank you. Bye.